when you have a goal, you just either meet those goals or die working towards those goals and you die happily. Hello, and welcome to Art Restart, where we explore how artists are reinventing their fields and building a new landscape for the arts. I'm Rob Kramer, the founder and CEO of Kramer Leadership, whose mission is to advance leaders for the greater good. And I'm Pierre Carlo Talenti, the producer and editor of this podcast, brought to you by the Keenan Institute for the Arts at the University of North Carolina School of the Arts. This week, we bring you our interview with visual artist Narciso Martinez. Narciso creates drawings and mixed media installations that focus on the lives and labor of the thousands of migrant agricultural workers on whom we all depend for our produce. Not only are the detail and atmosphere of each of his pieces breathtaking, but his canvas, so to speak, is also remarkable and evocative. He creates and assembles his work on and with discarded cardboard produce boxes that he himself collects from grocery stores. He knows his subject well, as he himself earned money to pay for his art education by working alongside friends and family in the agricultural fields of Washington State. Often, his work is monumental in size. In fact, through most of April 2021, a large piece of his was featured on a billboard in West Hollywood, California, part of the nonprofit Billboard Creative's annual exhibition throughout the Los Angeles City Basin. Narciso spoke to us from his studio in Long Beach, California. I started by asking him to describe some of the projects that are currently keeping him busy. Uh, I am currently working on a on a project that involves uh, an organization in Wenatchee, Washington. Actually, it's a it's, it was supposed to be an artist in residence, but because of COVID, uh, it had to move and it had to adjust. It had to be adjusted a little. Uh, I was supposed to go there and work with the community and doing a, a mural, but instead. Instead, we change it to like interviews through uh, the internet and exchange of images. And, and now I'm working with portraits of people who are involved uh, in the community with this particular project, with it, which is uh, renovating a park for the community. It, it is at, uh, the park is called Parque Padrinos, and it's at the city of Wenatchee in Washington State. And the other project that, I, that is close to happen is uh, Cultural Undertow which is an exhibition that, are all, that I curated through Luna and Ice Gallery. I, and it's happening at Teen Flats Gallery here in L.A. Uh, it's a show about two female artists of minority group, Tita Winnie Lick, whose background is Cambodian, and Gloria Sanchez, whose uh, background is Native American and Filipino and partly Mexican. And the other project is my solo show at Charlie James Gallery here in L.A., the gallery I'm working with, which opened somewhere in October. And the other project is taking place in Fresno, California. It's organized by Arte Americas. Uh, I am home from Oaxaca, Mexico, and it involves an exhibition about uh, Oaxacans in the Central Valley. And um, and so I'm looking forward to it. You're not bored. <laughs> no, clearly not. <laughs> wondering if you can talk about what the last, let's say, the last 14 months have had, both on your own artistic practice and on your artistic mission as a whole, because I know that COVID hit farm workers disproportionately. So, and I know it's a community that you paint and work with closely. So I'm just curious about if you could talk about what the last year has meant to you artistically and in terms of your activism. It's been interesting. Actually, I had an exhibition last year, summer in March, uh, my first uh, solo exhibition at Charlie James Gallery. It, it was it was open, it was hanged and everything, but there was no reception. It was supposed to open to the public in March, uh, right when we we took shelter in, in place because of COVID, and um, and so there was no opening reception. I didn't see the show until like months after. They decided to keep it hanged and open to the public months after by appointment only and that's one of the biggest changes that happened and um, also uh, personally I discovered that I need uh, people around me <laughs> at first I, I thought it was really tough and like oh yeah I, I love being in my studio on my own and just painting and that that's what happened for the f I, mean, I don't know for the few weeks at the beginning but then after I felt like I needed to go out and see people I was painting in my in my room at that time, 
uh, to the point that actually uh, got a studio space somewhere else, and um, and now I have a city space. And in terms of um, of the farm workers, I actually um, I don't know. I saw a lot of uh, cheering through the internet to the farm workers, and um, actually I was excited to see that uh, people were paying attention to the farm workers and they were being uh, essential workers. And because I still keep in touch with a lot of my co-workers, I, I used to work in the fields, by the way, and I still keep in touch with a lot of my co-workers. And I also have family members and friends who work in the fields. And I was sort of like, we, you know, asking questions, how, how was it, how they were doing. And it seemed like a lot of people were not, you know, we're not wearing the proper um, protective equipment, even uh, in the middle of the pandemic when they were already like being essentials. And so that's one of the things that was kind of sad, no? You know, a lot of our listeners probably aren't as familiar with sort of daily life of being a farm worker and an immigrant farm worker. What was your impressions of what life was like for these folks during this year of COVID? I think it was really, really risky, more than needy, I guess, I would say. I mean, at least from my, I know it's, farm workers are treated differently in every state throughout. Uh, some states pay their farm workers enough so they can sustain themselves, but some other states are really, really, their payments are really low and there's not much. There's not organizations that, that can support them. So it's really, it, it fares, I think, I, I'm beginning to understand. Uh, I speak to people, I've spoken to some people now, and like, and it seems like they're economically doing okay, but I think they risk, risk their health a lot, a lot, because even though it was a mandate that they would be provided the equipment, the protective equipment that they needed, it seems like it was not really enforced. And I can see that happening because... Uh, even without the, the the virus going around, farm workers who work in the fields are usually protected. No, they they when I was at least working in the fields, I wanted to protect myself from the pesticides and the weather conditions, e- either cold or hot. But it seems like when workers earn money by the contract, it's really hard to breed under under those conditions, right? When you have something in your mouth or your eyes, the glasses get foggy. And in order to make an extra buck, you just get rid of that, and uh, and no one seems to enforce that. So that's that's one of the major things that I that I learned throughout these months that um, it was not really enforced either. I don't know either because uh, the managers pretend that they don't see it or they didn't actually see it. One of your missions is to communicate to the farm workers' experience to people who may not know about them, right? Mm-hmm. So I wonder, what effect do you want your work to have on the farm workers themselves, on the subjects of your work? I think at first I want them to know that there are people out there paying attention to them. And not necessarily like visual artists, like painters or drawings like, like I'm doing, but also like, I don't know, movie makers and like uh, writers, you know, like that are writing about them and uh, specifically in on my work, in my work, I want to pay homage to themselves. I want them to see themselves uh, as worthy of being in art. I want them to be monumentalized, sort of like uh, I want them to feel like the work they're doing is important. Uh, first, I think uh, those are the things that I want them to see. I know there's been a challenge for me to take the artwork to to the farm works for them to actually see it. You know, because the because of the media that I work with, and also because of the nature of the the career, uh, which happens uh, around an institution, right? Like a like an art school. So it's been like a little bit of a challenge, but I'm working through it. I've experimented uh, a few times with vinyl printing, uh, life size vinyl printing and i have actually taken a few to the community where i actually worked up in washington state and uh it seems to work i mean the pieces are still up and it's been like what one more than one year since i took them over there and uh i'm working also with where where are they up 
Um, they are. I, I took four four pieces actually. I printed four life size six. Well, two are six by nine, and the other are a little bit smaller than that. Uh, six by nine feet, and uh, I printed four. My idea was to go to the town. It's a small town, and just go around to grocery stores and ask them if I could if I could uh, nail them to the wall outside so people can see it. But my brother, who happens to be in that town, was more like, um, I don't want to say aggressive, but like he had different ideas, you know. Like, I that was my idea because I was in a hurry and I would just like, you know, be there for a week and come back. But he was like more like, no, I think I think we can take this to the to the city hall and like where more people can actually see it. And uh, and I was like, okay, you are in charge. We tried to go to the city hall. You had to make an appointment, obviously, sometimes. And um, we spoke to people at the la- local library. And I left the pieces not knowing what was going to happen to them. But actually, he was able to speak to the city hall and got the city hall to place them in a local park. And two other pieces went to the library. So, yeah, it, it was uh, pretty nice to see it. They shared pictures with me and actually went back and took some photographs. Uh, later on but yeah that's one of the samples that were kind of successful in wow that's the great the, people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the lesson is to, to to make your family your agent <laughs> yeah my, yeah my brother is like a big fan now yeah that's sure. great are there goals that you have in terms of the the changes you're trying to make socially around the type of art you do what type of goals are you uh do you have for th- your artwork that's sort of like a big project, actually, that I'm I'm excited about, and and it, it, it started by a by a crazy dream that uh, it seems like it's taking shape now, a little um, little by little. Yeah, it all started like a long time ago when I when I was uh, well, it, I feel like it all started like really, really the reason why I went to the art when I went to school and I learned about you know all these artists who painted. The, the peasant, the working class, like Van Gogh and Millet. And I really wanted to paint scenes like that to preserve and to show the people that don't go to, that don't, don't know much about art or that they don't have access to art. And later on, when I was in art school, I had this class where I had to create like a schedule for a class when I was doing my master's degree. And um, I pretended I wanted a school, a school that would teach art to the community. Uh, in communities that are far away from the cities where they don't have access to really art classes or or uh, art itself. And so then when I started looking around and looking at my own uh, history and how is it that I learned about art because I grew up liking art but not because I saw a lot of art around me. It's just because, I don't know, I had have, I have paper and pencils and Honestly, I don't even know how it all started, really. I guess it all started because everyone, as kids, get like crayons and paper, and we are encouraged to do drawings, but not really learning that art can be more than that. And so that was one of the goals that I that I set on my head. And like, and now that I have the opportunity to, to when I had the opportunity to start this, I was like, what if I go to a greater scale? You know, like, uh, what if I create a space where People can come and learn about art. And so with this idea in mind and with little money I have saved, I started the project, actually. And I decided to start it back in my community in Oaxaca. Not necessarily to get away from the United States, but to have a collaboration between these two places that I have lived in now half of my life here and half of my life over there. And because I know people now through art school or through the art community, through the art world, people from different kinds of life, from like, I don't know, from different parts of the world, really. And now this project has grown to like be an artist residence based on my experiences of like go, doing a residency in Miami at the Fountain Hill Residency, doing a residency, residency at the Long Beach Museum of Art and at the uh, Long Beach City College. It seems like that's, that's a, a, a good way to to connect with people and to collaborate and so that's that's how like i'm picturing in my head and uh and that's that's a, the goal no that's the goal it, it it keeps changing and growing as it's taking shape 
So you've already, you mean you've already created a, a residency for an artist in Oaxaca? I'm, I'm starting to, I'm starting. It's not like, it's not like it's done, it's a done thing yet, but it's starting to take shape. Yeah, I'm in the early stages, I would say. I've been working on this in my head for like a year. Finally, we have some progress. Uh, I, I guess I should say what the pro progress is. Like we got the land, we got the materials to construct, and we had the people who are interested in, involved, in being involved in this project and see where, where we'll go and we'll see where, where we're at uh, next year. Wow. So you're actually, you're actually creating, building an, an art center. That's a big deal. Right, title. right. What, what uh, are you enjoying it? What have you learned about yourself through this new process? What are the the essentials that I'm going to need for that, you know, like, uh, am I going to need to leave my practice, my drawing and painting practice to, to actually lead this thing, or I'm going to be involved with something else? How are we going to communicate? You know, this is like a big question mark. I actually have, uh, thinking about, I've been thinking about this and like one of the biggest challenges was like how the, the language barrier basically. And I know now that, um, by looking around that there is a school in Oaxaca that that specializes in, in different languages. So I could collaborate with them and have some translators uh, whenever there's an artist in residence because the idea is to, to have some kind of exchange between an artist who can come and do work in the community, but also teach a class or two to the community. You worked in the fields to pay for your education and you earn your master's in your 30s. Where did you get that tenacity? <laughs> I think I really wanted to break the cycle, you know. Like uh, at one point, I learned that uh, I understood that um, that I couldn't do well in school back in Oaxaca because of uh, so many disadvantages. I guess you know, like growing up, uh, you worry about other things. Like oh, I have to, you know, like I don't know. I I don't know if I want to get into too personal but like yeah just growing up and not having enough to eat or like uh oh i have to go to the fields and take care of the cows when i get home or like i i don't want to go to school because i don't have shoes or i don't know my pants are too torn apart that I, it's embarrassing to go to school and learning things like that that didn't I, I i'm assuming didn't let me focus in 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 school and and the fact that really were indigenous people in oaxaca were really discriminated against i remember going to the cities with my parents and like people were just like looking at us like weird and like it, it was so strange no and um and in my family wanting to assimilate in in the city by not encouraging us to uh to speak their Zapotecan language or dress in certain ways you know and uh and I, I I didn't like any of that and i don't know it also like the church that didn't help as much why Encouraging people to just be within their psyche, within their thoughts of like everything is uh, destiny, you know, like everything is pre prevision, preordained. You, that you, yeah, yeah, that you cannot do more than what you already do, and that that's the way it should or supposed to be because someone said so, you know. That that uh, mentality I wanted to change once I understood that I could, you know, once I get to the United States and learn from my teachers here in school when I was taking the ESL classes and they were like, oh yeah, you can do this, Narciso, and and you can go you can do more if you want, you know. And at one point I was like, okay, yeah, these 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 people are not liars, you know. They don't have to could they couldn't be liars, you know. I think uh, I believe them and and so I work really hard and um and I really want to break the cycle and at one point I made my goal. And when you have a goal you just either meet those goals or die working towards those goals and you die happily. Would you say you've, you've reached your goal then? I did. Actually, when I was, uh, when I finished, uh, when I had my degree, I was like, okay, I'm done. I can die now. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it was such a, a good feeling. You no, know? in fact, I never, well, I didn't want to part I didn't participate in the, um, in the graduation ceremony when I finished my undergraduate, but, uh, because I thought it was all about like making money and stuff by the institution, but when I graduated with with the with MFA, 
I actually thought of like people who I was looking after and, and, and why is it that I was able to finish this goal? Because I, I look at somebody because I, I, somebody told me I could do this. And when I thought about my nieces and nephews and, and people from my community and other people, no, that just people in general who think that they can't do this because of whatever reason, I thought I, I should walk and I should like wear my attire and, and just to say, if I can, you also can. So I did walk. I, I walked on the on the stage when I graduated with my MFA, and I also learned that um, that the next stage after you're done with your personal goals is to give back to the community. You know, so I feel like I'm in the second stage now. Do you have a sense? And you've talked about your goals now being giving back to the community. Do you have an artistic goal that you think you're trying to reach? whether in terms of the reach of your work or actually an aesthetic goal you're trying to reach? Do you have, do you have a dream in that way? Yeah. Yeah, I do. I have dreams about my own practice, not necessarily a change in what I'm doing or what I'm focusing on, but, but in reaching out to other communities. No, I feel like uh, soon, hopefully I want to meet other workers within the agricultural industry, maybe travel to different uh, places and experience uh, and hear the stories of people who work in, let's say, the banana plantations or the cocoa bean plantations, the coffee plantations in, in South America and, and, and what their lives are like. Is it, you know, is it fair? Is it unfair? What kind of people work in the fields over there? Yeah, I like to, I like for them to be also represented in art and uh I like those challenges and hopefully one day it'll happen. What I love about this interview, Rob, is that, you know, his is clearly an immigrant story. It's mm. it's classic. He just grasped every available opportunity by both hands and mm. didn't take anything for granted. Yeah, he he sort of in some ways is summing up that American dream of when the opportunities come, you grab them and and don't let go. You know, one of the most powerful things yeah. I thought he said was when he talked about breaking the cycle. You know, of mm-hmm. his upbringing, of the the messages he would get from the church about ways to behave, uh, even coming to America and overcoming language barriers. I think that's a critical distinction and something we haven't talked so much about in this uh, podcast, Pierre Carlo. That many many artists have to break the cycle even non-immigrants here in our country, you know, often break the cycle of what it means to be an artist. If they, if they're Mm. raised in families that don't support the arts uh, or don't encourage risk-taking, don't encourage people to support their passion. uh, You know, it's very common in our country to go for stability, capitalism, you know, all the, all those societal pressures that exist in the United States. And I think simply the act of being an artist is to say, I'm going to be revolutionary and do something different. And, and, and so he's really demonstrating that critical, you know, life restart he did for himself. Of, yeah, that's uh, right. Yeah. Right? Reinventing himself, um, coming to America. And also, as he said, I love this idea that the second part of his life or the second step is about giving back. And part of that is, right. well, clearly he's won over his family, right? <laughs> right. His brother is his biggest fan and his his right. agent, activating to, to have his art in all the civic buildings in Wenatchee, Washington. Yeah. Uh, but also this idea of, well, for one thing, making sure that the migrant farm workers are able to see themselves represented and appreciated, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but also making sure that other people growing up, both in Oaxaca, where he comes from, and in America, other young artists have a chance to, like you said, to break whatever cycle, to appreciate right. the fact that they themselves are artists right. and to thrive in their art. Yeah. Yeah. I really hope he's able to bring his new cultural center to Oaxaca um, and bring it to fruition. I don't see why he shouldn't. He's clearly <laughs> unstoppable. He's got a lot of drive and motivation. <laughs> he's already got the land and the building materials, I think. It's incredible. Amazing. Yeah, And he's such a talent. If you'd like to see some of his work, go to uncsa.edu slash art restart and check out his interview page because we're featuring several images of his work. And I think it's really just breathtaking. It's beautiful. And if you haven't subscribed yet to the podcast, please do so. We've got some wonderful conversations with remarkable artists coming up in the pipeline, so you don't want to miss them. Our theme music is by Shanghai Restoration Project. 
I'm Pierre Carlo Talenti. And I'm Rob Kramer. Thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs>